Good afternoon. This slide tells you from where I am talking to you today. Costa Rica, a little tiny Central American country in the tropics. Now, why am I talking to you about barcode? Well, for us, the important question is why to barcode? And not so much how to do it. The how to do it part, of course, could be a whole other topic. Now, the why starts really with me when I was 14 years old, going to Mexico in 1953 to collect butterflies, like any scientist would. And I caught all those butterflies, and I brought them back, and I put them on display with my parents' help, of course, and the bank help, of course, and the Minneapolis Star and Tribune, of course, for public display to educate people about what I thought was interesting to me. 10 years later, I ended up back in Costa Rica again, doing the same kind of thing. 20 years later, Winnie and I, who are responsible for everything we're telling you today, we're back there being classical scientists in the forest, doing our studies. Like you would do to go to a restaurant look at the menu, order it, eat the meal, pay at the cash register and leave and never give a thought to the survival of the restaurant, which is exactly how we were behaving in 1985. But at that time, the director of the National Park Service of Costa Rica asked us to go to a piece, another national park in which we were not operating, but we were very familiar and ask us to help him figure out a solution to the 1,500 gold miners who had entered that park to do placer gold mining. Now the park itself we knew, gorgeous rainforest national park. We were very familiar with it, we're collecting insects and doing our ecological studies. And we got there and this is what we encountered. In other words, it would only take a few minutes to write a report as to what kind of damage was being done by the gold miners. But we had a week to be there. So what do you do for a week in trashed rainforest? What we decided to do was study the gold miners like they were animals in the forest. But what we discovered immediately was that these were middle-class Costa Rican citizens who felt morally perfectly justified to be doing this because basically the park had no owner and basically the park had no function for the society. We went back to San Jose and said to the government, hey, forget your military desalojo and think about talking to them about that it does have an owner and that it does have a function for the country. That's led us to where we are today, to working at creating the situation where Costa Rica can itself become bioliterate about its own biodiversity and biodeveloped with respect to by all 5 million people who live in the country. Topic is called BioAlpha, which means in Spanish, derived from Spanish, bioalphabetización, which is simply bioliterate in Spanish as opposed to in English. And that's the direction, that's the why part, not the how part. So, what does Costa Rica have to work with? Well, it's a very tiny country for a very small area of crop little tiny country, as you can see, placed on the United States or scale up there. But if you measure the crop itself, the biodiversity, 4% of the world is sitting in Costa Rica and 4% of the world is North America. 
So that gives you some idea of the raw material that this country has to work with in biodevelopment, in its own bioliteracy. Now, we, of course, were not able to start thinking about this for the whole country. But we did settle on another national park, already in Concepcion Guanacaste, up here on the left hand corner, uh, which is about the size of New York City and its suburbs, or London, if you like, and its suburbs, um, and uh, contains about 2.6% of global biodiversity that's living inside of it. But on the front door of this government operation is the word development. It's the only national park in the world that has the word development on its front door. Basically saying, that is what we're trying to do to keep this place a national park. So what do they actually work with on the ground? What's, what's there on a per hectare basis? Well, we take a malaise trap, which you all know about, and we put the malaise trap on the top of the volcanoes, on the rainforest at the bottom, and on the dry forest at the other side of the bottom, and just a few kilometers distant from each other. We run those malaise traps for one year. Out of those three malaise traps for one year, we produced about 20,000 species of insects, which is getting on to about a quarter of what's in Finland, or maybe a third of what's in Finland, and a quarter to a third of what's in the UK. So we're talking about a huge olus of species sitting on a very small amount of terrain. I should add, incidentally, that for you thinking of those three different ecosystems, there's only 31 species in common between the three ecosystems. Each one has its own fauna with its own biologies, its own ecologies. Okay. Now, if you think this is just peculiar for Costa Rica, there's the country of Costa Rica projected on the country of Colombia. And right up here in the corner is the little green spot here, which is the ACG, the piece we're talking about very directly today as a pilot project. Well, Colombia, in their official documents, thinks that there is a roughly 11,000 species of invertebrates. Now think about that for a moment. Our estimate of Colombia is 8 million. Our estimate for Costa Rica is 1 million. And the ACG itself, we think, has about 60,000 species in it. Now, up until 2003, our way of doing inventory was all your, everybody's way. And you collect it, you put it in museums, you hope that taxonomists will work it up here and there. And effectively what you're doing is putting it all in a morgue where it sits. It gets used and worked over, yes, but it doesn't have any real relationship to the outside world. It's a world frozen in 1960s and earlier taxonomy. Well, at the same time, 2003, we were getting names and understanding the, the literature relationships and the phylogenetic relationships on it by looking at these species visually. And not only were we looking at it visually, but the taxonomists who were working with us, all of you all, were also growing old, retiring, and dying. This was where our taxonomic expertise was headed and going and is today, almost monthly. So right at that time, we found ourselves exploring a whole new world with all of these pieces of information, with all these organisms. It came about for us as totally innocent people listening to this guy here, Paul Bear from the University of Guelph, in Canada, talking to the whole genome people who were very turned on by human whole genome research, saying to them, you know, all we need is a little tiny piece of that genome to tell species apart. This little piece right here was the piece he picked out because he found that it worked. 
one little gene called CO1, about 1,500 base pairs long, and one little 650 base pair piece of that ought to be enough to tell species apart. Effectively, what we heard him saying was, in a short time, there should be something in your back pocket that costs what this column costs, nothing, with a hole in it. And you take a piece of the organism you're dealing with and you put it in that hole. And gadgetry reads the little piece of DNA, transmits it to a DNA library that transmits back to your comb, to you, what it thinks it is. Or it says to you, we don't have that. And effectively, you can put 8 billion people on the same team. Okay. And effectively, what we're talking about, of course, is relating the organism in your hand to an encyclopedia of life. So effectively, it's taking one leg off of this little moth right here and putting it in this little plastic plate. And out of that plastic plate comes this DNA barcode, which is effectively a 650 letter word with an alphabet of four letters. That's a blog. I can't read that thing, but machines can. And furthermore, a number of you sitting in audiences looked at this thing and said to me, hey, Dan, that's not the one that goes with that fly. Huh? In other words, you're even capable of reading those words. I'm not, but machines are. So we go back to our stalemate that we were at in 2003. And in this particular case, John Burns, the world level skipper taxonomist, is looking at our reared things, which are here in this drawer, saying, you know, I think that might be more than one species. There might be even six species in that drawer, but I can't effectively separate them. So there they are. You, can, you tell me how to tell them apart. No way. So Paul visited the Smithsonian and we said, would you take home a bag of the legs of these butterflies and tell us what you think? So there's 473 legs in a plastic bag going back to Canada. Out of that came 10 different species. Now, of course, Costa Rica got very excited about this because this was their animal, their place, their, their, their world. Okay. But it also impacted a lot of the rest of the world by realizing suddenly that yes, the morphology tells you a lot, but it doesn't tell you everything. And there are more examples, lots more. This is a very common butterfly here that tourists see all the time, putting out fruit, butterfly comes feed on the fruit. And 100 years ago, it had two names. Because one astute morphological taxonomist noticed that the endoconial tuft right here on one was light yellow and on the other was dark orange. But we don't find them by catching them with a butterfly net. We find them by finding the caterpillars. And what we found was that all of these feed only on one family of plants and this only on another family of plants growing side by side in the same piece of forest at the same time. And they can be very easily told apart by their DNA barcodes. Or the host plant, if you know the caterpillar from, but you can't tell the adults apart. The genitalia are identical. The, the butter, males, and these are all males, but the males and females are basically identical. Here's another example from the same forest. Each one species of plant, no, excuse me, one genus of plants. And there's seven species who are all called by one name for hundred some odd years. Now, of course, they are realized to be different because the barcode said, oh, so now you go to the work, which no people don't normally do, of pulling the genitalia out of the males and cover each one of them. There's seven different species there. Sorry, five different species. This is one animal known since about 1906 as one species all over Latin America from Brazil way up into Mexico. Turns out to be three. 
And there is a turn, it turns out to be a very minute my morphological difference. This little triangle, the little wedge that you see right there and right there, you notice that this one doesn't quite get to the edge of the white area. This one gets to the edge and this one goes actually a little bit over the edge. So that's, that's one way, the genitalia are identical. Food plants, the same thing. And in fact, we can get all three of them feeding on the same individual food plant in the same place. But they are ecologically separate very well, as well as they are by their genes. This is one species over here, the blue dots. The yellow dots are another species. And the red is a species that lives only where the dry forest and the rainforest come right next to each other. It's the same for other kinds of insects, not just butterflies. These are parasite cocoons on one of the caterpillars that we rear all the time. And these are the little wasps that come out of those. And that wasp was known by professional taxonomists to me, giving me a name or one name, Panales leucostigmus, because of the white, little white stigma that it has on its wing for a hundred plus years. When we barcode them, we discover that there's 39 different species in that cluster each one eating a different species of caterpillar, which we can say because we reared them from caterpillars. Now, who does the work? Well, the category is called parataxonomist. And that's borrowed from the word paralegal and paramedic, okay? What they do is find the insects, in this case, caterpillars in the forest, bring them in, rear them, or hang lights in the forest and get the insects and bring them in and, bar and barcode all of that. It produces a product. So now we think of this as a product from the rainforest, it's not just insects in a collection somewhere. Every one of them is individually labeled. Every one of them gets an individual barcode and every one of them now we can tell apart and know what sibling species there are or what cryptic species there are or what complexes there are by using the barcode as an indicator to get there, then you have to dig further. But not only do the paratoxonomists collect these things, bring them in, process them up to where they land on your desk, but also they work themselves on the biology of these things. In this case, Gloria is showing on her laptop what she does to a group from Colombia who contain government politicians, commercials, NGOs, university people, street people, all learning about how this works by actually seeing it and doing it for a week inside of Costa Rica. So what Gloria is showing them is this. This is a page out of what are called species pages of which they've now done about 1,500. And behind each one of these photographs that they took is a natural history account about that species, which they have reared all of these. And this is in Spanish, on the web, free of charge, available, and it's used by people from Chile to Mexico all the time. And if you click on one of these things, we not only get Gloria explaining this to Colombia, but the actual kinds of authors, right? So if I click on that one, this is the author. 30 years ago, Osvaldo, was a fish killer. That was his job. That's his life. Today, he's a paradoxonomist with a steady job as biodiversity manager instead of killing fish. Okay. He didn't make it through sixth grade. This is a, a group of paradoxonomists who are doing this work in the field. They're not graduate students, they're not undergraduates passing through. They're people for whom it's a, a career 20, 30, 40 years of doing this kind of biodiversity management. Now, let's think a little more about malaise traps. You all know what a weather station is. It measures raindrops. A malaise trap is measuring insects, which are equivalent to main raindrops. So if you can think of those insects as raindrops of different qualities, different temperatures, different times of year, all those different things, then you begin to get information more than just taxonomy from a malaise trap. 
But not only do you have paratexonomists who can do this thing, and they do earn a salary, so they have a cost, right? Somebody has to pay that bill. But you have a whole lot of other people in the country who can contribute sweat equity as well. And in the case of the government has national park guards for all the national parks. Being a guard in a national park is perhaps the most boring job there ever is, except perhaps washing dishes in the back of a restaurant. And so what we realized was with the government, we could collaborate to have the government learn how to do it. Malaise traps, these are all park guards or park administrators coming to see and learning in a two day intense workshop. They then go home when they collect the course of the insects that come out of that bottle or go here, right here. And so that's, you know, that's a week worth of government collected insects. They go back to their parks with the trap, with the knowledge of how to set it up. And they put it up, they decide where to put it and they get the results and they take care of it all year long. Not only that, to much to our surprise, they went back and photographed a photograph and published a photograph of themselves doing this to show people what they were actually doing and taking care of their national parks. But what struck me was there's a gun right here on his waist and there's a gun right there on his waist. These are park guards, guns and gold badges who are now being converted into being paradoxonomous, to becoming career biodiversity managers rather than just sitting at the front door of the bank. And now they're all over the country. So they put these traps out all over the country. And so now we're getting a sample, an enormous sample from of the biodiversity of Costa Rica, just from this sweat equity. So the point being is there's a, a, a society out there with many, many different institutions, many different members of those institutions who could all be contributing to this if they're allowed to. If the technical thing is set up for them to be able to do it, they can do it. You can find out what's in a country. It'd be the only country in the tropics anywhere that has any idea of really what's inside of it. So now we're talking to, back to taking Costa Rica and facilitating its own biodevelopment for itself and for its world. Its world are those other tropical countries out there who also don't know what's inside of them. So we go back to this photograph, which you've seen before about where the malaise traps were put in these three places. And we look at a malaise trap set right there at the base of this volcano. There it is. This is the formal national park, untouchable, okay? This out here is wild forest bought by the government to destroy, meaning bought by to do industrial development. And in this particular case, the industrial development is uh, geothermal development to produce geothermal energy to make electricity for the country, fine. Well, right in the middle of this huge forest is this big pool of hot water. So you stick a straw into that pool of hot water, out comes the steam and water, and you use that to drive an electric generator, basically. So that gives you a geothermal project that generates a lot of electricity for the country. So to collaborate with this, we sit down with the engineers, the people who do the industrial development and get their blueprint. And they show us and they allow us illegally the permission to set malaise traps at the margin of where the site is going to be 50 meters away and 150 meters away in this direction, this direction and this direction away from the road, the access road. So there it is. This looks horrible, like a bomb had been dropped in the rainforest. And this is gone, but the trap is there from day one. Because they give us permission to do it. They get interested in the topic here. Of why and what and what can we show from this? There it is a year later when it's, the site is being fully developed. Trap still right there. There it is. In, pro in doing the drilling and all the setting up of the project itself, there's the trap right there. And so it's monitoring the whole year, the noise, the sound, the lights, the diesel fume, all that other stuff. You get a whole lot of numbers 
you barcode those things, and you very quickly discover that the margin itself, yes, it alters the biology a great deal. But 50 meters into the forest, 50 meters into the forest, no impact. The world doesn't know, that biological world doesn't know that this open spot exists. So yeah, hmm, that's interesting. And it also, of course, changes the way an industrial development in a forest is viewed. Because remember, this is not an oil well. This is not something that's spewing a lot of toxic material. But it is cutting down the trunk of forest. So you end up with a hole like that. They say, well, you know, that's going to be a horrible open spot for 30 years, 50 years, 100 years. Hmm. You look at it, and you look at it, and you suddenly realize, wait a minute. That's a landslide. That's just like a landslide in the forest. And there are landslides all over the place in national parks. This is one after a recent hurricane that we had here. So you look at that, you realize, whoa, that's the same thing as an industrial development. But you also realize as ecologists that the forest is gonna re re recover that site. It's gonna grow back over it. Okay, so you say, mm, well, then the geothermal site isn't really uh, like a landslide. It's going to stay open. But this is a river running through us. What do you have here? A landslide. There's the bear down place in the middle where the terrestrial organisms don't make it. This is the edge of the landslide, and this is the forest itself. In other words, if you change your way of looking at the forest because you come to understand it, then it becomes more palatable too, even though, of course, the damage is done. I quite agree with that. But it also, all kinds of other damage occurs in societies, which we quite happily accept. When you do an operation on somebody for appendicitis, that is an acceptable scar and so on. So here we are now, because it is an industrial site, seven years later, and there's our same trap right there on the margin. So it's been monitoring this for seven years. So now we can ask, has the impact or the influence of this open site expanded? We're doing that analysis literally today, now with the data from the last seven years. And um, just to give you some idea, what's happened is this one trap right here on the margin. So here's the margin of the plot of the, site right here. This one trap right here has collected 25,000 species of insects from one trap over seven years. We've got that far on the analysis so far. The nine traps that were put all around the site have collected, getting on to a million and a half species. What those numbers look like as actual graphs, this is that one trap right here over seven years. And what you can see is that, well, you thought maybe you were getting them all after one year or two years, it just keeps going up and up and up and up. And the whole collection of traps all together, I, say, I just said it wrong, it's about 40,000 species, not, not a million and a half, it's a million and a half individual insects for 40,000 species and uh, 45,000 somewhere in there. And uh, uh, the, the whole point here is, is that the, we're dealing with an enormous pool that nobody understands what's there, what content it has, and what structure it has, or what species are in it. And that'll stay that way until we can do the taxonomy, a first pass taxonomy by DNA barcoding of one fauna or another. But it's more than just the barcoding. It's more than just the, I, the industrial site. This is a black fly here, Samuelidae. Okay. And it's feeding on my hand. I reach out and I squash it in there, and that's my blood. You say, well, that's my blood. Yeah, but what other blood did that fly have in it? What other parasites was it carrying? Well, when we got to deal with barcoding the gut contents of these flies, we discover that not only were there seven species of Simuleidae working this particular industrial site, but also that they have, were feeding on a whole variety of vertebrates many of which these flies had the reputation for feeding on only human beings. And now when they discover they're feeding on bats, on birds, on rodents, on small ungulates, and monkeys, the whole package are being fed on, which you can determine by looking at the blood, okay, by the DNA barcode in the blood. 
This is no surprise to you as audience, but it is still a surprise to the general society. Another outcome from this was that the arch enemies of the Park Service, which were the National Industrial Electric Company Road people, suddenly discover that, wow, there's something we can do with the park people. And the park people suddenly think, wow, we can something we can do with these industrial people if they won't sit and listen instead of view us as guys with guns and gold badges. And the in first major paper that came out of this is, is authored by government employees, foreign government employees, foreign scientists, paratexonomists, Costa Rican scientists, commercials, all together on the same part. And they all work together on this data, how to interpret it, how to think about it, and all that sort of stuff. That for Costa Rica is a major, major breakthrough. So what we're really talking about is generating a GPS for biodiversity. That's already coming down the road. We all know that. COVID pushed it hard, but it was being pushed hard before. You won't be able to have on their iPhone, your smartphone, whatever it is, something that allows the equivalent of that comb in the back pocket. And that's already there now. And people are then writing papers about not only it, but getting that DNA from air, from water, from soil, and using it in a variety of ways for society. This is where you're gonna be in 10 years. Put a gadget up, hanging on a tree in the rainforest. If you've got the library of the barcodes to go with what that gadget collects out of the air, you can very quickly begin to monitor many of the things in that forest just from the air flowing by that gadget. So we're going from this way of looking at biodiversity. This is a paratexonomist explaining and teaching children about the basic biology of these organisms up to where you'll be able to swipe this beautiful animal here and know who it is. Is it, is it poisonous? Is it not poisonous? You don't have to have a teacher standing there to help you necessarily at that moment because these are farm kids with no income at all, really. And yet when they do the education program that runs run by the ACG with those farm kids in the local schools, three quarters of them pull out of their pockets right now, a camera, they take a photograph. That photograph is seen by 40, 50 other people at the same time. Once they know really what the animal is they're photographing, then they get, the whole world is exposed to them to develop. Thank you.